friends to our third episode of Interviews on Voice Matters. Today we have David Harris and Laurel Mahaffey here, and they are the creators of voicescienceworks.org. And I'm really excited to have them here talking with us about vocology because they are an inspiration to me, and I'm hoping after you see their website and get to know them a little bit better that they will be an inspiration to you as well. So David uh, got his DMA at the University of Colorado in choral conducting and literature, correct? Okay, and he's currently teaching at AMDA LA, and he's also part of a choral collective, but I'll let him tell you about that more in just a second. And Laurel is working on her master's degree in voice at USC, and is Lynn Helding your supervisor there, or your advisor? Yeah, she's my voice teacher and mentor, and yeah, big reason I came down here, so yeah. That's wonderful. I'm hoping to get her for an interview very, very soon, actually. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, they both went to the Summer of Ecology Institute in Salt Lake City, Utah. I was there in the, the summer of 2012, and you guys were there in uh, 14? 14, yeah. Okay, okay, great. And then they both taught at Holy Cross in Boston together for a time. So um, a lot of history and a lot of ecology, and I'm hoping to kind of dive into the conversation with you both. So welcome. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so the first thing I wanted to ask is uh, for you to talk a little bit about VoiceScienceWorks.org and how it got started and what you love about the site because we talk about your site all the time. And <laughs> yeah. so we actually, the, I think it was the day we met or a couple days after we had our first conversation about what it would mean to have a website uh, with some of the things we that we both cared about from vocology on it, I was thinking something that would be more like a very simple cross-reference chart for choir people. <laughs> and I said, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it took a few years before for us to launch it, but it was something that was kind of in both of our minds before we ever met, even, um, with the idea to share. And I think we can speak to this for yourself, but it seemed like we both had this, we had been through enough confusion in our own lives and in our own worlds around the voice that, and we were finding some clarity with vocology and the terminology and the way it applied and wanted to find ways to help other people come to that information much even more easily than we had, which, you know, I had read lots of books, I had been to lots of people, I had talked and had lots of conversations, it was still confusing. And so SVI brought a lot more clarity to my experience and there's still way more yet to go, <laughs> but, right. but it, it was kind of a codifying moment that helped us refine that vision a little more. Mm -hmm. And I think to working with the choirs at Holy Cross and having this really limited amount of time as you do in all choral rehearsals and having this partnership we created where I would come in and just introduce an idea for even just five to 10 minutes at the beginning of the rehearsal and then David could implement it throughout the rehearsal with the singers and then each singer would come and work with me one-on-one -on -one, and we would just kind of sit down and be like, is this making sense? Like. Do you understand this language? What, what are you struggling with? Um, that process really inspired us to kind of go more global and be like, okay, we are finding quicker ways to say this. Let's put it out there. Yeah, the first time, so right after SVI, that next fall, uh, it was, we met and I invited Laurel to come out and work with me soon after because I was looking for somebody with her skill set. Um, and it meant she had to come out for a, a chunk of time um, so she came to Boston and uh, like the first workshop we did was during a summer retreat with the choir and those three days we shared just really dense information. Way too much information. <laughs> <laughs> and they all loved it but it was like nothing stuck because it was all just way too difficult. So over the next two years we refined and refined and refined and refined and um, after about a year of that we, well I should say. Once we did that for the for about three months, we realized we had something that was shareable, and mm -hmm. then started talking about okay, what could a platform look like that could go out to the world basically online, and so we started working on the website in earnest. Then uh, Laurel came up with the idea for the site name, and we started kind of saying okay, what of this could translate into a web format? And it took us about a year to get to where we were serious, and started creating content. Wow. So when did you officially launch? A year one ago. One year ago, yeah. Only one year ago? Yeah. Said our first birthday, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just, yeah, just the beginning, just <laughs> the little seeds. 
it seems that you're joining a community of people through the website as well, like sharing information across different people's ideas and, and philosophies and whatnot. Well, and that's another critical part of what each of our personal experiences were. Um, you know, when I went to SVI, I worked with Jeannie Levitri in New York, and that was my first introduction to bookology. And um, I, I still had gobs of questions, you know. Right. I had a few terms, but they weren't working like I was told they would work. So, um, so I emailed her and I said, where else can I go? And she suggested SVI. Uh, so, but I, I, before that, I had been digging through libraries and, you know, picking up this book and that book and reading through it and saying, that doesn't sound right or that sounds interesting, but, you know, and they're just, again, that clarity wasn't there. Well, there was nowhere two years, three years ago um, where you could go and find a central source of information about Bocology. Right. And even the Pavo website doesn't really do that. So that was one of our main goals too, was to just create a hub so that anybody who's working in the field, we're trying not to judge it all. We're just like, if you're trying to do vocology, we'll put a link to your site and let people figure it out um, to show that the community is vast. Because I ran into it at Holy Cross. I, I was trying to promote the idea of hiring voice teachers who had some experience in voice science. And I would just met with a wall. Um, and one of the walls that I hit was nobody could find reference to vocology online. Yeah. <laughs> so they thought I was making it up. I mean, they knew I wasn't fully making it up, but they didn't have proof. And so the conversation stalled out pretty regularly when it came to actually taking action. So that was another reason we created it was just to share so that people who didn't know could at least see that it's a real thing and, and that there's this huge network of people. Yeah. And I think the whole, the, who else is doing what is a whole tab on the site and we've got mm -hmm. all the various organizations blogs websites software um courses conferences that we're always trying to keep updated and that was a huge part of the mission and um just the message that it's not like this is our brand and you can only get info from us and we own it and we put our stamp on it but just that it's a hub and you can yeah. go this way, you can come back, you know. This is not proprietary information, it's free information that we all have access to, but it's just hard to understand. So we're trying yeah. to make it simple, but it's not ours. I, wanna, I would right. love to get your perspective on what it means to you to be sharing so freely with us. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I've thought that the information that we're sharing and want to continue to share would never replace the kind of experience you would pay for with mm -hmm. someone in person, including mm -hmm. us, including someone else's teacher. Right. So, you know, there's like the know that and the know how, and the know how, they can't replace each other. And so we're putting out the know that because to me that just feels like, you know, in the age of Wikipedia and just how the internet works, like that people want to know now and they want clear and translatable. And so to say that in order to get that, you have to be able to understand these really dense papers. You have to be able to have read through all the books and found them. And then that just leaves people up to just be hit by all the myths and all the confusing language that's out there. So to me, that's just kind of baseline. Like we all should have that to me. It's like, you know, equal access, like fundamental rights. Like we should know, you know, how sound works, what is happening when I'm creating sound, like what, what translates into what. But then to go through and get it into your body and to get it into your emotion and your career, of course, none of that is something that, of course, you're going to pay someone for. And that's the process. That's and also their living. Um, so, yeah, I don't really see them fighting each other. And there are elements that we do, of course, have to charge for, like workshops. And we're coming up with some online courses. So I guess we've, like, just separated it as if we're going through the process with you of exactly how to implement it in each step and getting you there in your own system, then that is something like a class that you would pay for. But if it's just baseline knowledge, let's all have it kind of like a group grassroots movement. Um, <laughs> I have no problem giving that. Yeah. You, that. you mentioned in your own story, um, you know, having to go to all those different points and wanting to create a straighter line for people. And we were talking just a day or two ago about, um, the baseline information that's currently in the voice world, you know, there are terms like diaphragm and uh, people often say uh, bright and, uh, you know, maybe head voice and chest voice. There are terms that are used pretty ubiquitously. Um, 
you know, all of those concepts have been around since the 15th century or 16th century, sorry, um, when, you know, the term head voice was created and people knew about the diaphragm since probably the 18th century. You know, these are not new things, but that's the baseline knowledge, I would say, that's across the board. And so, like Laurel said, the things that we've put on our website under the tools page, um, we believe should be the new baseline, right? Oh. This is information that is, you know, should come up in, in choral rehearsals regularly is the question of, you know, what's your resonant strategy? Which harmonic are you bringing out and why? How do you know how to adjust in order to bring out another harmonic? Th those kinds of things. It's just real kind of baseline information in, in our opinion. Um, and there's a gap between the standard voice user and, and that knowledge. But mm -hmm. it's at least my vision that in, you know, the next several decades, people can rise up to that baseline and then start accessing uh, you know, Donald Miller and Ingo Tietze if they want to, but at least we're all operating from a standpoint of knowing that there's a power source, a resonator, and an oscillator. And we know, you know, about the micro shifts of the resonator and what the tongue's doing, you know, these basic things to us are basic, but what, as you mentioned, even looking at our website, it feels so dense, right? Right. So how do we get people to look at it and they, oh yeah, I know that part of the anatomy. Oh yeah, I get the basic concepts of resonant strategy. I get Lorentz registration on a basic level. That's kind of what we're after. Or where do you see the future of vocology heading? Like, a couple of questions are running through my mind. One is that we don't really have a codified language around voice yet. Do you see that that is something that's developing? Are we getting there? I think we're codifying like just some of the objective things, but as far as the perceptive things of how I'm actually feeling it and how I get my body there, mm -hmm. teacher uses language to get you to have that reaction. I don't know if we can ever codify that because that's part of that creative process. But to me, it's all about like translation station. Like there has to be whatever, however someone says it to get you there. As a learner, I at least to know, need to know some things behind it besides just like, oh, well, just imagine it or just make it better or make it prettier or brighter. Like I need to know some something underneath has to have like parentheses, like, oh yeah, we're talking about higher harmonics, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that way, no matter who I work with or what room I'm in and all these other volatile um, factors that go into singing, I can have something underneath it to say, oh yeah, this is about vibrations in the air, like something tangible besides just how I happen to feel it that day. So yeah, I guess there's yeah two different parts, but if we can keep all the cool creative approaches, not codify that, but at least know where they're all mapping back to in reality. <laughs> yes. Yeah, two stories, one, uh, a student of mine at AMDA, a freshman, um, and AMDA is a, a music theater college in Los Angeles and New York. And um, I just teach in Los Angeles, but he came, he was struggling a lot last semester. His voice had gone through a change. He had been a child actor and singer and been on stage a lot. And so he didn't know it was, uh, I think you were saying, you know, my voice just worked, his voice just worked. And then it didn't. And he had no idea what to do with that, right? And we see that all the time. Um, as we age, our voice changes radically, just like our bodies. And one day it doesn't work. And if you don't know what's going on, then you feel like it quit working and you can't sing anymore. Yeah. Um, and that's tragic, right? Yeah. So anyway, we, we worked through it. He made enormous progress. He's singing beautifully now and um, in one semester and, and, you know, just really exciting what he's doing. But somewhere in the middle of the semester, he came in and he said, you know, how do I know what my falsetto is? All these older kids are talking about, you know, well, your falsetto does this, that, and the other, and well, you don't know about it yet because you're not old enough, or those kinds of things. And, and it was this kind of microcosm of, of the perfect example of what the voice world does, right? That if you don't know how to describe it, but you have a term, you can hang it over somebody's head. Even if you don't intend to do that, it becomes this kind of voodoo that nobody can touch other than you because you said the term and you know how to do it, whatever it is, right? But they don't say it. He just wasn't ready yet or whatever in the language. So he came in and he said, you know, how do I know what to do with it? These terms that they're throwing out at me and my voice isn't doing this. And I said, ask the questions, you know, what's going on functionally? Because, mm -hmm. and, and how, do, how do you define what they're talking about? If you don't know what they're talking about, ask them to define it. And if they can't, then it's really just a voodoo word, right? Yep. And, then come in and, and we can try and unpack it together um, anyway, so the little bit of apology that he knew at that point, it was like the fifth week we'd worked together. He was able to put some concepts to it and some terms, and I helped him flesh out a little more. And 
and we talked about learning to registration. We talked about resident strategy choices. Um, we talked about experiences he had physically, you know, and, and we're able to kind of concoct a definition that he could work with. Ultimately, in my hope for the vocology future, um, that kind of conversation can happen. That, you know, when a conductor, which happens all the time, says, no, no, um, I need you to sing this, you know, like a bag of Cheetos or whatever they say. <laughs> right. The singer has the tools to say, okay, bag of Cheetos, that means orange, okay, so I need to come up with some mid-range harmonic or, you know, whatever. Yeah, and they can yeah. quickly kind of decomp decompose that, you know, all the different leaders that come in front of them and say, no, no, this sound, no, no, that sound, or just simply rehearse them for a while and say, good. And then some other person yells at them the next day. I mean, that's, so I guess that's one part of the vision is that the singers have the tools to kind of break down those thoughts and, and recodify them for themselves quickly. Mm -hmm. But then also that anybody who's working in the voice world from coaches to singers, to conductors, to teachers, to whatever, um, have enough of the language so that they don't just use tools as weapons, or sorry, terms as weapons, but are actually um, helping the singer think through what's going on and, and how the knowledge of what's going on translates into their physical sensations and then into their ultimate performance. But as we get into sports science, um, a friend of mine of my family's um, is a renowned sports scientist. He's the one who came up with the idea of the pitch count, which if you're familiar with baseball, once a pitcher reaches a certain number of pitches in a game, from little league to professional, they're pulled. And they're, that's because uh, our friend figured out that um, through science, <laughs> that if you, after a certain number of pitches, you run the risk of injury, it, it goes up like 70%. So they just know, take them out at that point, they won't get injured and it's worked. And there's been some blowback, but, um, but everybody's adopted it. And so I called him and, and we had this conversation and uh, he said, long story short, sports science was in the same place that voice science is today, back in the 80s. Yep. But as CGI was coming into Hollywood, they needed somebody who had knowledge of the body enough and the way the body interacted in space to help them create uh, graphic imagery in movies. So all of a sudden, sports science had this massive infusion from cash, from George Lucas and people like that. They said it just shot up. People all of a sudden had money. Then they were, their opinions were heard more. <laughs> and, and now sports science is a major player. And in fact, we get a lot of our information on the way mm -hmm. learning happens in sports science because it's similar. Yep. And so what we need is a George Lucas to care about. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, yeah. But so it just shows, you know. Everybody in, in athletics does not agree with the approaches that sports science has brought forward, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, there are articles and articles about how the pitch count is ruining baseball because yeah. it takes power away from the managers, right? right. Um, but everybody's using it because pitchers aren't getting wounded as much. And so it, functionally, it's, it's happening and it's working and there's more of a baseline there now. So, you know... It's a little bit different in the voice and the way people get hurt and how even the concept of being hurt is used as a weapon sometimes. But mm -hmm. um, in an ideal world in the future, I see that we're at least communicating on a level that's, that has a little more um, mm -hmm. awareness of and access to a basic knowledge. Um, yeah, and, and what I hear you saying too is that, that we're in a time of empowerment and we're trying to empower people to know enough about how things are working so that we can make choices right. you know because if we're going to be in an athletic endeavor it, it it behooves us to know something about how our bodies work right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and yeah that word choices we like a lot that the more the more we find out about the voice the less we think that it is just one thing and it's only this one optimum you can only use it this one way and everything else is wrong um and that is a long history in the voice tradition but I think that idea of kind of codifying and us all coming up with different language plays into that, that we've just been kind of throwing this idea around that like everything, the way we describe every element of sound is kind of just on this linear black and white spectrum, bright to dark, head voice to chest voice, loud to soft, forward to back, like, and so we just think like, oh, well, it's either this or that or somewhere in the middle. And I think if we could just kind of expand thinking of sound in a different way that every sound has 
unique factors and attributes, but because they're all interacting together, we can't just say, oh, turn the dial up on that. Like it's each one is its own process to get there. So yeah, I think the more we kind of just understand sound, the less we can get away from those kind of limiting this or that options that seem to be our only descriptors for that word. One of the um, greatest challenges that, that is facing that development is the proprietary nature of voice instruction itself. Uh, mm -hmm. We're taught, you know, as young singers, that the person who's working with us is the greatest authority on the voice. And, um, and that what they say is, goes, and that's, then it, you know, if you're in college and you're singing in a lot of places, you have a voice teacher who's that authority, you have a choir director who's that authority, you have an orchestra director who's that authority, you have an opera director who's that authority, your jazz instructor is that, and so it gets really confusing really fast, and that's why a lot of wars start and that kind of thing. But at the baseline of all of that is the question of authority. The, yeah. the idea that I think that's there, not because we're necessarily pig-headed, um, controlling people but because we're confused people <laughs> it's more than we understand and it's massive and yet we're in this position of authority over people's experience and so i think what we're taught to do in the voice world is to become really hard become really insular and say my way is the only way i know what's going on and don't let anybody else mess with you and do exactly what i tell you because we just don't know enough about what we're doing <laughs> so i mean some people might disagree with that, but even the people who are the most successful tend to know a few things and tend to be able to make those work for them to a certain point. The, right. the antidote to that is allowing the student to be an active participant in their learning mm -hmm. um, and allowing yourself to be quiet sometimes and, and knowing how to ask questions rather than give determinations all the time mm -hmm. and those kinds of things, which is a, a learning process in itself. Um, but then looking at the greater world too, the same thing is true. So. Uh, like with C3LA, that's um, the uh, choral collaborative that I'm in. It's the third collaborative choral collective of its kind. I was in the first and the second one too. <laughs> Actually, I was in the first one, I started the second one, and I helped start the third one because um, it's a wonderful way to make music. But one of the challenges of it being a collective is that we're all equally in charge. And so, um, you know, every other choir that I run, I just set up an agenda of voice instruction. And, and everybody does it with me and, and we kind of go, right? When mm -hmm. Laurel worked with me, it was awesome because there were two of us doing it, but we still collaborated. She and I had a, a, a focused vision, right? Mm -hmm. With a collective, everybody's doing a different thing. There are lots of voice teachers in the group, lots of choir directors in the group, mm -hmm. and all have their own opinion. So um, I asked if we might be able to do a, a workshop with them at the beginning of this uh, cycle. And they all showed up and we did our workshop mostly focused on laryngeal registration and acoustic registration. And, um, and they all were great and participated and were excited about the information. And now the conversation is totally different because they feel like they're invited into it. They see the information even at a basic level. Um, and so when, you know, I've been, they've asked me to do the warm ups this whole time to kind of reinforce that in practice. Yeah. And, and as we're doing them, and as I'm asking questions, they're bringing their experience forward. And so it's a conversation now. Whereas in Boston and New York, with those collaboratives, when I tried to bring up stuff, it was a fight. And it's just that little shift was allowing them to invite us in. And so I think that's one of the things that hmm. the, the voice, the ecology world is gonna have to continue to uh, figure out ways to ask people if they can be invited in rather than mm -hmm. beating people over the head with, well, I know everything now and you don't know anything, which is a real tricky line, which is, yeah. which may not be what people are doing, but it's what it sounds like when you say, I have a method and my method's mm -hmm. right. And if you right. want to learn, you have to come study with me and nobody else knows, you know, it's the same story. <laughs> right. That's really hard. And what I, what I also experience is a great deal of fear. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there's, there's a lot of, you know, people guarding their territory in terms of methods and, and how they understand voice. And I get it if, if you don't understand exactly what's going on underneath or, you know, it works because it works and you don't want to have to explain it to everybody because that's mm -hmm. just a waste of time. It just sets up this whole dynamic of, of fear and separatism, you know, yeah. like keeping everybody out and keeping yourself safe. 
And I think that's one of the things that I really want to see happen is that we can like all kind of go in and say, you know, I'm scared too. Mm -hmm. And I, I do this thing and I don't quite understand why it works, but I do understand why this works. And, and can we have a, a conversation? I love that word conversation, Yeah. you know, yeah. and like, and let being invited in and, and being humble, you know, that's one of the big things I learned from Ingo is like, when you go into a new situation, you make yourself small, you make yourself humble. Mm -hmm. And, and that really works. So I'm yeah. like, we like, you know, we all want to worship him and he will just not allow it. He is just one of the learners in the room. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like if you have a question that he doesn't understand, he's like, that's a great question. Let's look into it instead of, oh, well, it's probably this and shame on you for asking questions, which sometimes we get from educators. <laughs> right, um, right. So that's the saddest thing to me when someone's fear of being wrong or feeling small again for maybe when they were a learner keeps them from being curious. It's like, aren't we in the business of, learning and asking questions and doesn't that mean ongoing and um yeah that can be so sad when that is the biggest wall of like I can't learn anything else because it might mean that I'm wrong and therefore that whole self-esteem spiral but yeah one of the things we're doing as an initiative we're working on a book right now that's all about games and how you can play with this information because we play music we don't work music right and so and, and we play it learning too if we're if we're healthy lifelong learners it's always a game. It's always a, oh, this is fun. I'm interested. Like watching Ingo when you ask him a question you didn't know the answer to, you know, he pauses and he kind of looks into his head and he'll go up to the board and start writing equations. You know, it, it turns into fun for him because he didn't know. And all of a sudden now it's something to chase. Um, and so like helping people know that they can play with it, that it's not going to crush them because they didn't know it all of a sudden, but that it's really this fun place to explore new stuff yeah yeah and that that makes me think too that if we make this exciting if vocology becomes an exciting question mm -hmm. mark for everyone where your fears and your humanity and everything can come to play then that's how we're going to invite more people in or get invited to the party because if you're yeah yeah, yeah, yeah if you're yeah, that's something you do so well, like with your straw pouches your mom made, mm -hmm. and like, <laughs> and that's, so <laughs> they're so cool. fun, and like, that's also a total vibe of our site, is just like, kind of fun, a little more pop culture, um, humor, too, in this yeah. really serious formants and equation <laughs> language, um, I think that, yeah, that's always been really important to us. And, and that's, that's something that I really want to highlight with you guys, too, is how creative and playful and just colorful everything is on your side. I think it really reflects your personalities. And I think it just, it hearkens all the rest of us to say, oh, how can this be fun? Like, what can we do that would be really, really fun with no matter whatever we love, right? Yeah. Do it. So how would you advise someone to tap, someone else to tap into their creativity in terms of their vocology knowledge and practice? To start with, Laurel gets almost all the credit for the visual layout of end design because that that was the part of it. When she finally came online with, okay, this is how this thing's gonna look, then it became like, uh, yeah. <laughs> no Excel spreadsheet. No oh, spreadsheet, okay. right. <laughs> and so from somebody who, you know, I've I've never excelled myself as a visual artist. Um I was told young that, you know, I didn't do art well or whatever. And so it was one of those things. I've always enjoyed I love visual art and I love participating with it. And I love drawing and stuff. I'm just haven't habituated those things. So when I, she showed the template and now I've had, every time I build a page, I always have to think questions like, um, okay, what is visual appealing? What catches the eye? Um, what images are gonna tell another story or tell this story as well if nobody reads the text? You know, those kinds of questions. And, and I think Laurel said, like with our blog, she wants at least three or four photos per blog, mm -hmm. you know, if possible, to, to tell those stories and to keep it to where people could just scan through it on their phone kind of thing. Yeah. But, so I guess, but thinking of other people and all the skill sets people have and bringing that into whatever they're doing or maybe just voice, like I, we've been thinking a lot about um, the slashes in everyone's identity, right? Like most of us aren't just singers, at least mm -hmm. singer, teacher, author, um, I actually double majored in costume design and vocal performance, so I have a whole design component in me, and I feel like when I do one of my slashes, I almost am, like, embarrassed about the other ones, or used to be, and I'm like, oh, I can't bring that in, mm. or I can't 
can't even list that. I can't tell people, oh, I also like to do costume design and I've directed a few um, opera or scene productions. Like, I feel like you have to wait on that or people won't take the first thing you said seriously. Like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, you're not that good of a singer. Got it. Like, you know, <laughs> but I think I felt like my most complete self when I brought all of those skills and passions into one project. And so, yeah, allowing um, that design or that, you know, colorful flair, whatever it is, come into the world of voice. Like, cool, that's awesome. And I think there's room for it and it feels just so much more genuine to me. So, yeah, I think just whatever all your slashes are, like listing them with pride and then letting them all feed each other and maybe even feed one project. Do you ever feel a little nervous about putting your creativity out there like that? I think, I don't honestly feel nervous about the more creative parts, but um, I mean, we are dealing with information that it came to be through extreme uh, peer review and processing and careful waiting, right? Yes. I'm not going to put I'm not gonna study out there until I finish crossing all the T's and dotting the I's. And so, I mean, we are we're that translating step. We're putting it then, we're translating that really carefully processed information into more direct, faster information. So we're always trying to be really careful about that step that Mm -hmm. it's not, we're not losing um, the quality or the integrity of the original information, Mm -hmm. but just taking it in its simplest form, but not oversimplifying. So that is definitely where we want to feel cautious and want feedback on that, um, that it's not, the process of making it accessible hasn't disrespected the original source in some way. Yeah, and just listening to you talk and, and having this conversation, it, it's reminding me that we have so much to cover. There's mm-hmm. information to cover, there's translation to cover, like we mm-hmm. talked about earlier, but this is just such a, to me, it's like the wild, wild west. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We're all trying and we're coming into new levels of information and understanding it, and community as well. And so this is a this is a really wonderful time for people who are interested to to start yeah. joining forces and, and getting to know one another. And that brings me to my last question, which is if somebody wanted to um, add to your pool of information or get involved in what you're doing with voicescienceworks.org, how could they do that? Oh my gosh, we are always looking for contributors. Like if someone wanted to be a guest author on a blog or um we're hoping to have actually an intern program soon so people will keep up to date with all the courses that are out there and editing content. Uh, content. We have a whole book reviews blog, so if anyone wants to contribute a book review of a book they found really helpful. That would be amazing. And then we have our newest project is um, the online zine that Liz was an author for, for our first episode, The Unfiltered Source. And our uh, next issues coming out in May and it's all about myth and so always looking for guest authors on that um, even just guest we just kind of do a lot of surveys and just kind of get people's inputs and have to be a full article it's very kind of an outside the box um, visual art poetry yeah, visual art, short stories yeah. comics <laughs> we like all of it yeah so it's absolutely right now it is mostly the two of us because that's who's putting in the work, but we're hoping to absolutely expand that author and contributor base. Okay. As we build, you know, we've been toying a lot with what the future looks like. So as we build, hopefully, you know, a 501c3 board, we'll include more people, we'll have more input. You know, we want this to be a movement, an entity in itself that, you know, that isn't just us, but is this thing. So yeah. Hopefully, if, if somebody's really interested and sends us an email and says, hey, I'd, I'd love to be a part, we'll find a way as, as we develop in that structure and figure out what those ways are. Also, you know, if, if anybody's doing something online currently, if they have a blog, if they have a website, if they're doing workshops, whatever, please email us and let us know because we want your information on the site too mm-hmm. um, so that it really, you know, it's the build a longer table, not a higher wall concept, you know. That's beautiful. I'm going to have to quote you on that. Yeah. <laughs> or whoever he quoted. You quoted. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I have to say, too, what, you know, I said, I think, slightly jokingly, but not fully, when we were having coffee in Los Angeles when you were here in the fall, um, that reading your blogs, it feels like you're kind of the Liz Gilbert of the uh, voice world and not 
not because your names are the same, but because you, you speak with such a sense of compassion and openness and community, helping, I feel like each time I read your blogs that um, I feel like I have permission to try again. Yeah. Um, and that's a really cool voice and, and a really important one at a time where there's so much transition because people need to feel like it's okay to take another step. And that, that's a hard thing to feel when the world's moving around you so fast. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I just, I so appreciate your time and, and your openness and, and your hearts and um, just to be able to spend the time. So I, I hope that as things develop in the next months and years that you would be willing to talk with me again. And oh, to, yeah. yeah, just even if we pick a subject and, and delve a little deeper on something more specific, I would love that. And um, like, like David and Laurel just said, if anybody has anything that they'd like to contribute um, to voicescienceworks.org or get involved in any way, shape, or form, like, please reach out. Um, they're open, and I would love to hear everyone's contributions through their, through their work, too. So um, anyway, thank you guys so much for your time. Yeah, thank really you. Thanks for having me. And hopefully we'll talk again soon. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Bye. Bye.